And so some of the members will be voting and then coming, uh, coming here to join, join the hearing. Um, uh, happy to hear uh, today to, to uh, inter introduce and to welcome Martha Williams. I'm the husband of a woman named Martha, so, so immediately uh, it's a good start there. But uh, Martha is uh, President Biden's nominee to serve as the director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service. I think she's been joined by uh, her daughter here today, and I ask that you introduce her when you, when you speak, and anyone else that you might like to, to introduce. We have uh, Joni Ernst. Good morning, Joni. How are you? Okay. Um, we, uh, we thank you for, uh, for joining us to discuss your vision that is important uh, in, uh, in the role that's important in order to field uh, questions from, from the members of our committee. Uh, as our nation's oldest federal conservation agency, the Fish and Wildlife Service has responsibility of enforcing our wildlife protection laws, uh, restoring habitat, and preserving public lands for future generations. Uh, those are tall orders. Are tall orders, especially given the current and future biodiversity challenges that we face in this country of ours. A recent report by the United Nations shows that nearly one million species, nearly one million species, may be pushed to the brink of extinction in the years ahead. Uh, they could face extinction, uh, and uh, somebody needs to do something about it. And we are part of those somebodies who need to do something about it on this committee. Uh, that alarming the number is a dire warning for all of us uh, to do uh, our part to protect our planet and all of God's creations that inhabit uh, this planet. The report also underscores the importance of having a dedicated, results-driven leader at the Fish and Wildlife Service who brings people together to tackle these challenges. I'm confident that Ms. Wils uh, Williams is that kind of leader. As the current principal deputy director of the service, she has a clear understanding of the inner workings of the agency, and her experience is not limited, not limited to working at the federal level. Prior to her current role, she served as the director of the Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. For, for how long was that? Forever? A long time. Okay. A long time, All right. Chairman Carper. All right. Throughout her career, Ms. Williams has cultivated deep respect from those uh, with whom she's worked on conservation efforts. And that is probably why her nomination enjoys such broad support amongst environmental and sportsmen communities, from Ducks Unlimited to the National Wildlife Federation to Earth Justice. Many of our nation's foremost conservationists are hunters, are anglers, or wildlife enthusiasts, strongly support her nomination for this role. Ms. Williams grew up on a farm and has spent her life and career fostering a love of the outdoors and a commitment to protecting our precious natural resources. Uh, last month, I had the distinct pleasure of hosting her and a number of her colleagues from, uh, from, the, uh, from the agency in Delaware as we uh, toured one of our two national wildlife refuges. This is one called Prime Hook, which is in the southern part of our state, just north of Lewis, Delaware. And um, joining her was uh, Assistant Secretary Estinos. I'm delighted to, to host you that day. As uh, she heard me say then, uh, we're incredibly proud of our two national wildlife refuges. In the first state, Prime Hook, which we visited in Bombay Hook, was just to the north of there. In addition to being home to threatened and endangered migratory bird species, such as the red knot and the piping plover, our wildlife refuges attract thousands, thousands, tens of thousands of visitors each year from all over the world. And these visitors drive a booming uh, ecotourism industry in Delaware and other places too. Unfortunately, these special places are also vulnerable to rising sea level and worsening storms. In 2012, <clears throat> Superstorm Sandy hit the first state of Delaware and wrecked havoc on our coastal communities, including Prime Hook. Using relief fund provided by Congress, the Fish and Wildlife Service engaged in a large-scale large project to restore approximately 4,000 acres of tidal marsh. And this restoration project benefited wildlife and the surrounding community. It's a real win-win. It's also an example of the Fish and Wildlife Service's successful conservation work to adapt uh, to adapt to the escalating challenges of changing climate while making our natural resources more resilient. And I'm eager, I think we're eager, uh, to hear from Ms. Williams about how the Fish and Wildlife Service can build upon this extraordinary 
model. As I like to say, find out what works, do more of that. This worked. Ms. Williams will have no shortage of essential work ahead of her in this role, should she be confirmed. Uh, our staff and I look forward to partnering with her on this uh, important mission, uh, concerning this uh, committee's strong bipartisan track record of working together uh, in a lot of ways, uh, but especially on wildlife conservation issues. And with that, uh, let me turn it over to Ranking Member uh, Senator Capito for her opening remarks. Senator Capito. The staff tells me she's voting, and uh, I'm sure she'll be here uh, soon, and uh, at the appropriate time, we'll uh, hear from, from her comments, and I know she'll have a bunch of uh, questions as well. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, Ms. Williams, um, you're recognized to, uh, to uh, let us hear your statement. Make sure your mic is on. We want to hear every word. Thank you, Chairman Carper. And um, when other members arrive, Ranking Member Capito and members of the Environment and Public Works Committee. My name is Martha Williams, and I have with me today my children, Kate and Ian, and I'm joined virtually by my partner, Doug, my parents, my siblings, and family across the country. I'm also joined in spirit by my late husband, it's an honor and a privilege to be here as President Biden's nominee for Director of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. I believe that public service is one of our most important callings in this great nation of ours. And if I am confirmed in this position, I look forward to serving the President, Secretary Holland, the Fish and Wildlife Service employees, all of the American people, and the resources that we steward. I come from a family that has served our country and communities with courage. My father and uncle as Marines, my grandfather's in the Army, an uncle in the Air Force, my father-in-law, and another uncle in the Navy. My father is also a civil engineer, a bridge builder, literally and figuratively and he has been known to use his skills as a force in conserving working landscapes. My mother is infinitely capable and is a fierce leader in her own right, most importantly, as a teacher of nature. During my youth, we spent our time together cutting and baling hay on hot summer days, often racing to beat the rain, and on rare and special time off the farm we ran barefoot on mossy paths in the Adirondacks, watched newts change colors, fished, swam, paddled, and hiked together. Growing up on a farm taught me the joy and the necessity of teamwork, how to work hard, and to appreciate nature and the natural resources that our great country is blessed with. Developing a life, family, and career in the West made me realize the importance of context in place, both defined by the need for autonomy and reliance on community. I've learned that the best way to build a team is to hold oneself to the highest standards, work side by side, sometimes literally mending fence, and sometimes just lending a hand or an ear. My life is steeped in conservation. It's what I think about, it's what I see, smell, hear, and dream about. I am a lifelong student of nature, the outdoors, fish and wildlife management, people management, and what it takes to solve seemingly intractable natural resource issues. I've worked on a number of these challenging issues and from various perspectives, whether as a customer of the Fish and Wildlife Service, as the director of the state of Montana's Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, in the legislature, in the judiciary, as legal counsel on issues before the service, and as a teacher making sure to impart on my students those skills they need to lead us all into the future. Using a scientific wildlife management and collaborative approach, and always with others, I've tackled tough wildlife management issues head on. Sometimes we have made only small yet durable steps forward. Other times we have made great strides 
in habitat restoration and conservation, bison restoration, predator recovery, cold and warm water fish recovery, tackled invasive species, supported law enforcement, wildlife movement, organizational and people management, and very importantly, the develop development of conservation leadership. Wildlife and natural resource conservation rests with all of us, from rural and remote communities to large urban landscapes, private land, tribal lands, and public land. It is a shared responsibility. We all play roles in this important American model, and it is with a strong commitment to collaborative conservation that we can achieve our collective goals. The Fish and Wildlife Service's role in conservation covers inspiring breadth, depth, and importance. With at least one national wildlife refuge in each state and territory, the service can make access to nature available to every American. Its mission to steward migratory birds, wildlife, fish, and their habitats, and ultimately the ecosystem functions for all Americans is critical to the well-being of our economy, communities, and people. Each program and region within the Bureau contribute to this collaborative and multidisciplinary effort to steward the health of the interconnected ecological processes that are so important, whether locally, nationally, or internationally. If confirmed as director, I will apply two central tenets to leading the Fish and Wildlife Service to its conservation mission. The service will adhere to its underpinning of scientific integrity, and it will work collaboratively, leveraging the expertise of our many partners, whether state, tribal, or local governments, private landowners, organizations, or industry. It is truly an extraordinary time for the Fish and Wildlife Service when both the challenge and the opportunity to maintain healthy ecosystems and healthy populations of wildlife have never been greater. I make this promise that it can, if confirmed as the next director, I will give it my all to serve with courage and excellence. Thank you, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee for your service and for your consideration. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for an excellent, uh, excellent statement. Uh, Senator Capito has voted and she's joined us now and she's gonna make her statement and then we'll get into some questions. Senator Capito. Thank you, uh, Chairman Carper. I'm sorry I missed your opening statement. I know it was a I barn give burner. It again. I no, can... please don't give it again. <laughs> um, and welcome to the committee. Uh, as, as you know, and uh, you've been around here before, we have a lot, lot of uh, moving parts uh, today. So. Um, we are so excited to have you in front of the committee and really want to welcome uh, Kate and Ian. I understand I missed their introductions, but I know you're very proud of your mom today, and, and uh, I'm really pleased that you were able to make the trip with her. So that's nice for you as well. Uh, so good morning, and we are considering the nomination uh, to lead the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service of Ms. Martha Williams. Uh, we had the opportunity, and thank you for coming by my office last week. Was that just last week? The other week. I guess it was two weeks ago, and I look forward to hearing more about your work at the service uh, in this testimony today. I applaud the service's expansion of hunting and fishing uh, in the lands and waters that it, man it manages, which was announced in April, and I, we, we spoke about that briefly. As you know, our sportsmen pay a key role in our conservation efforts. I look forward to working together on more ways to expand outdoor recreation opportunities across the country, including in my own state at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, which is absolutely gorgeous, and also at the Canaan Valley National Wildlife Refuge, where we have a new Fish and Wildlife Center that I worked on and uh, have seen, and it's, very, uh, it's a great educational and um, beautiful way to pay tribute to a sort of a very unusual uh, art, um, uh, mountainous region of our state. As we discussed in our meeting, while I'm encouraged by the efforts to expand hunting and outdoor recreation opportunities, I am concerned with a number of planned regulatory actions uh, introduced or, or announced by the service in this administration. Uh, the impacts that those actions could have on landowners and the timely delivery of needed infrastructure packages uh, are significant. 
timely project construction is critical, we, another thing we talked about. In particular, as the administration works to implement the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that the President signed, and uh, the Chairman and I were lucky enough to, to be there right on the podium while he did that. Uh, we will not fully recognize the benefits of this law if permitting and environmental review processes bog down projects with delays and duplicative reviews. And uh, make no mistake, this is not to shortcut any reviews that we would have. It's to shortcut the time that it takes these reviews to move forward. For example, the service is currently taking public comment on an additional new potential permitting program for the in uh, incidental take of migratory birds. We talk about the need to streamline the existing permitting, but this action adds another layer of requirement. You referenced the importance of timely cons consultations and reviews, but I'm not sure how another burdensome layer will achieve this goal. In addition to aggressive regulatory actions, I am disappointed about the administration's lack of transparency, particularly on climate and environmental issues. Ms. Williams, I hope that we do not see this lack of concern for transparency occur under your leadership at Fish and Wildlife, and I, I will probably ask a question to that, uh, to that effect. We are continuing to see aggressive policies and actions from the White House. Devi despite the potentially wide-ranging effects of these proposals, administration leaders are hiding the ball from the American people, making it difficult for us to hold the administration accountable. We should have more information that from the president to consider today. More, we should have more nominations uh, before us today. We're, don't get me wrong, we're pleased to have you here because this is a critical agency. I have raised this multiple times, but President Biden has not put forth a nominee to lead one of EPA's most significant offices, and that's the Office of Air and Radiation. In fact, yesterday marked the 300th day of the, uh, that um, Joe Goffman served as the acting leader of that office. To give that further context, 300 days is the maximum amount of time he can serve as an acting leader under the Federal Vacancies Act. 300 days and still no nominee. This is the very office that is reportedly developing the growing number of costly and far-reaching environmental regulations that President Biden and countless administration officials and Mr. Goffman raised in Glasgow. President Biden has also not put forth a nominee to lead the Federal Highway Administration. Can you imagine us putting into effect the bill that was just signed into law without somebody leading a very critical agency? This will be, they will play an integral part in the implementation of the um, historic uh, Infrastructure Act that we just passed. The agency responsible to oversee the safe use of our nation's nuclear energy plants. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is currently working with just three commissioners with two vacancies. Instead of ensuring transparency and accountability to the American public and Congress, the President has chosen to rely on his climate czars sitting in their offices in the White House. The senators on both sides of this aisle are here to fulfill the institution's constitutional role of advice and consent. It is time for the President to stop delaying and nominate individuals for these critical posts and to stop shielding the administration's decision. So I thank you again. I thank you for letting me take the, take the time to pop off a little bit on another issue. Um, I would like to note as well that uh, Senator Daines, who um, is our colleague from Montana, who served with you for, or has uh, become very, very familiar with you through service in Montana, wrote a very glowing reference to the rest of us uh, in favor of your nomination, and uh, that, I think, carries great weight, and uh, I congratulate you for securing that from a good friend of both of ours. So I thank you for being here before us today, and with that, uh, we'll go to thank the you. questioning. And uh, would you like to uh, enter that letter for uh, the record? Yes, I'll enter the letter for the record. Uh, without objection. Okay, uh, we have uh, three, uh, I call them perfunctory questions we ask of witnesses who've been nominated for, for different roles, uh, but they're important questions, and I'm gonna ask them uh, at this time. Uh, the first uh, of those is, do you agree if confirmed to appear before this committee or designated members of this committee and other appropriate committees of the Congress and provide information subject to appropriate and necessary security protections with respect to your responsibilities? Do you? I do, Chairman Carper. All right. Second question. Do you agree to ensure that testimony briefings, documents, and electronic and other forms of communication of information are provided to this committee and its staff and other appropriate committees 
in a timely manner. Do you? Yes, I do, Chairman Thank Carpenter. You. And my third uh, question would be, do you know of any uh, matters which you may or may not have disclosed that might place you in a conflict of interest if you are confirmed? I do not. All right, good, thanks. And now we'll proceed to uh, members' questions. And uh, I'll leave that up. Tell us just, uh, take 15 seconds, tell us about the farm that you grew up on. Just a little, just a little bit about the farm. What did you raise? What did you do? Chairman Carper, so it was, it's a working farm. My parents still live there and still work on the farm. And we had a variety of crops that have changed over the years. Um, we also, had, when I was growing up, we had uh, dairy cows. We always had steers, uh, chickens. Um, a menagerie of animals that people would drop off, <laughs> knowing that um, my mother and the farm would take care of them. Um, we had horses. Uh, right now, they're growing uh, sorghum. Um, we always had very um, award-winning alfalfa at the state fair and corn. All right. Sounds like a pretty good place to grow up. It's a pretty good place to Have grow up. Have your kids ever been there? Uh, yes, they have. It's called, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, it's called Camp Granddaddy. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> a good name. All right, let me start. The first question I have is regard, uh, with respect to the Endangered Species Act, conservation without conflict. The Endangered Species Act has worked uh, quite well to conserve and recover species in our state. Uh, people travel to Delaware from around the world to observe uh, our endangered species, specifically birds such as the red knots and the piping plovers that I mentioned earlier. Last month when we were in Delaware together, we learned about the Fish and Wildlife Service's impressive work to prevent new species from requiring Endangered Species Act protection, an initiative known as Conservation Without Conflict. The Northeast Fish and Wildlife Service region is leading a collaborative effort between uh, 10 states to conserve the salt, uh, salt marsh sparrow, a bird that is especially susceptible to the impacts of climate change. Question, would you elaborate on the importance of the Fish and Wildlife Service leadership role in coordinating this effort and efforts like it? And would you share with our committee how you intend to support the Conservation Without Conflict Initiative if you are confirmed? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I also want to thank you for the um, lovely visit to the special uh, wildlife refuge in your state and, and to see firsthand some of these issues with you. Uh, so I have worked with As I recall, it was a perfect day. It was <laughs> we have a lot of those in Delaware and West Virginia where I was privileged to be born, so I know firsthand, but it was a great day. It was a perfect day. Mr. Chairman, um, so I have a long experience with the Endangered Species Act and have thought about it often. Um, so I come at the Endangered Species Act from a, very, from a number of perspectives. As a customer uh, working for the state of Montana, um, as counsel to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as a teacher, and because I love the outdoors and nature, so I think about it often, and um, I would answer that, as I said in my opening statement, we all share in this responsibility, and that um, it is a collective effort. And so while the, in the Fish and Wildlife Service plays a very important role in stewarding species once they are um, on the, in the emergency room of the Endangered Species Act, we also play a critical role in supporting these partnerships to help prevent species from ever needing to be listed. And I think that that's where we do some of our most important work. And um, there are many examples of that, and I'm, I'm really proud of and happy to see that growing across the country, the various efforts, specifically conservation without conflict. And I think that conservation without conflict coalition is extraordinary and um, in a time it's a product of our times. It, for example, represents 50 entities, and its focus is um, I will, if confirmed, I would, will make sure that the Fish and Wildlife Service's focus is the same, is to be creative and to be thinking in a coordinated effort. And as I said in my opening statement, to leverage on all these various expertises of all these different parties. So, um, I think that 
there are many examples of where the Endangered Species Act has succeeded, and uh, not least of which where it has encouraged these types of partnerships and has encouraged states, uh, private landowners, tribes, municipal governments, um, NGOs, industry, all, all working together. Another very good example, I think, is in the southeast, and, and I think of also the National Association of Forest Owners working on wildlife initiatives, where they're working across um, with many different partners. And really, as you do in this committee, it's, it's not, it's a bipartisan issue. It's not a partisan issue. It's one that touches all of us. All right, thank, thank you. you Mr. Um, I, I think uh, I'm going to hold and ask uh, my, my next questions in, in a, little, a little later, and we'll let the other members of the committee go ahead and start. The, um, uh, just to telegraph my pitch, uh, our, our, my colleague, uh, Senator, uh, from West Virginia has uh, mentioned the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill that the president just signed in to law. And I'm going to be asking a question with respect to wildlife crossings when, when uh, I uh, have my next shot. But I just want to say again to uh, Senator Capito, to every member of this committee, to our staffs, how proud uh, we were on, um, on Monday together there on the lawn uh, in front of the White House. We're signing into law maybe one of the two most extraordinary infrastructure uh, bills in the history of the country. And uh, legislation that uh, with this committee reported unanimously uh, out with respect to roads, highways, bridges, service, transportation, with respect to water, drinking water, water sanitation, and uh, provided really the foundation on which the bipartisan bill was, was built and signed into law. The president knows that, and, uh, and we know that, and we're just very, uh, I, I would just say to everybody who's been a part of that on this committee, uh, thank you uh, again, Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to the transparency issue. Just uh, this is hopefully a short answer, just to impress upon you. I think I did in my opening statement how important transparency is, and uh, I think the frustrations sometimes, and this happens on both sides of, of the aisle. Whoever's whoever the president's the opposite party, uh, I think more information is better, and I, I think there's no reason to to hide why decisions are made. At some so I'm asking you to pledge a, a uh, you know a an oral pledge you know of of transparency and and full open door policy so that we can have that give and take that I think is so critical Senator Capito absolutely I'm very comfortable making that pledge and agree with you that transparency yeah. is so important in building trust in government and in trust in what the fish and wildlife service um, how we deliver on our mission so I look forward to working closely Thank with you, you. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, I'm going to go to a question on the endangered species. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service, I believe under your leadership, has announced intentions to uh, revisit Endangered Species Act language uh, that references economic impacts. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that economic impacts should be considered when making an ESA listing or, or um, a determination? Senator Capito, um, I, I would love to back up a little bit too and, and, and repeat that I think that the, and I share with you on this, that the Endangered Species Act is a very important environmental law and I am committed to ensuring that if confirmed, the Fish and Wildlife Service implements it in an effective way um, where we achieve its goals and where we're being transparent. Um, so, yes, this administration is reviewing, um, first off, under an executive order. We have reviewed a number of regulations that were promulgated under the previous administration. And I think that's wise to go through how those rules were promulgated and do they make the most sense going forward. I promise to you that um, I think about this all the time, too, to be very careful in swings of having a regulation apply one way and then and swinging hard another way. Instead, I think you will see with the number of uh, regulations that we are thinking of, build back better, if you will, and thinking of more durable long-term solutions to prevent that swing back and forth. So I recognize that the Endangered Species Act has uh, economic impacts and is very important to you and your state. 
Um, but I do think that the statute at the same time is very um, clear in when economic impacts should be uh, part of a determination and when they shouldn't. So when, are those, when are those times? Uh, uh, Senator Capito, I, I should know more. I don't have the statute in front of me. Um, so I can't answer that right now. Maybe we could get a clearer answer. For, we'll I'd be happy to because I, right. I can just go through the statute. We'll move on. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, on the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the service in 2019, the service repealed the so-called blanket 4D rule for threatened species. The previous administration cited the Obama administration's shift to more tailored rules to increase the state flexibility, encourage private landowners to recover species but the service uh, recently announced its intention to undo this reform. How has your experience as a state wildlife uh, official informed your view of the role of 4D rules in regulatory relief? Have you, you've obviously administered under both of these, a blanket one and, and a uh, non-blanket one, for better word. Senator Capito, thank you for that question. Um, and I want to thank you again for getting to visit with you a couple of weeks ago. It's hard to believe it's been a couple of weeks ago. So I think that um, 40 rules can be very important in providing flexibility, um, especially for states. Um, so I, I don't think they are always needed, but I think that they are a very important tool that the Fish and Wildlife Service, if I'm confirmed, will continue uh, to use to the best advantage and flexibility for um, all involved, but also while adhering to the, to the law and to the science. Okay. Um, Lastly, um, you know, the work that you've done, and you mentioned this in your open statement and then in your response to uh, uh, Chairman Carper too, the importance of um, private landowners as partners in conservation. Could you expound on that a little bit? Yes, um, thank you, Senator Capito. Well, uh, you know, many states have large percentage of uh, public lands and more and more in the West. But at the same time, um, private land is critically important, and I don't want to use that term of art <laughs> out of turn. Um, private land is very important to the conservation of species. And uh, for example, the America the Beautiful initiative, what I like about it is a focus on collaborative, locally-led efforts to support conservation and to support working landscapes. So I think private landowners and uh, private landowner partnerships play a very important role in conserving species. Thank you. Uh, Senator Padilla. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Williams, uh, thank you uh, again for your testimony this morning and for your years of public service and dedication to natural resource conversation. Certainly enjoyed our conversation yesterday and appreciated uh, reviewing your written testimony where you cover uh, two central tenets uh, for your work, ensuring the Fish and Wildlife Service adheres to scientific integrity uh, as well as to work collaboratively with partners and stakeholders. These tenants will be especially important to your work, as we discussed yesterday, when it comes to California water issues and ecosystem preservation. Uh, California water is always a challenging topic, and I know that many of my colleagues on this committee, even those that are not from California, are familiar with how contentious water issues in California can be. We have to uh, carefully balance the needs of many interests, including imperiled wildlife and fragile ecosystems as we plan to address present day challenges, let alone prepare for the future. So striking the right balance will require the personal involvement of the director to coordinate with other interior agencies, with the NOAA, with the state of California, with tribal governments, and many other very active, and might I say opinionated stakeholders whose uh, lives and livelihoods depend on water and a healthy environment. Uh, Ms. Williams, during our meeting yesterday, I was pleased to hear your commitment to visiting California and to personally engaging on these critical uh, water issues if confirmed. So can you describe uh, for me and the committee 
uh, if confirmed, what your approach uh, would be to working with the many stakeholders in California, not just on water, but on a number of issues. Thank you, Senator Padilla, and I too enjoyed the opportunity to visit with you yesterday. I very much appreciate that. And uh, California water is uh, an incredibly important issue. Um, and yes, I do think that it uh, would be helpful for me to go to California, to your state, and um, to be very closely engaged in the issues, that it, it's, it's too important not to, to delegate completely. I have faith in um, our public servants and working with them on these issues. And to date, I have um, very closely worked with the Bureau of Reclamation, with our sister agencies, with NOAA, NIMPS, um, with the state of California, uh, with tribes. So uh, I would agree with you that there, there are many, um, many partners, many voices, sometimes strong, understandably so. And I think that California water is one of the most challenging issues we do face. As uh, you are, I'm sure, painfully aware, this was a very difficult year in face of the drought. So um, there is much work to do. Uh, we'll never be able to let up on the gas on that work. And um, it's very important. So I look forward to engaging more. I look forward to visiting. And I look forward to hearing from people in person on, the, on their perspectives on these matters. Right. And uh, a comment, not necessarily a question, unless you want to offer some thoughts, but you know, prior work experience and relationships is obviously helpful. Uh, a commitment uh, uh, to uh, demonstrate willingness to, to collaborate and partner uh, is necessary. But at the very foundation of it is building credibility and building trust especially on contentious issues, and at a time that we're living where there's even too often a fundamental debate as to what is truth and the value of data uh, and the uh, significance of scientific contributions, those sorts of things. So again, my comment, feel free to respond if you'd like. Yes, please, uh, Senator Padilla, that's right, that the scientific integrity with which we work, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, is critical to building that credibility. And um, if confirmed, I know that we will, uh, as I said, place uh, a continued import on scientific integrity. And yes, in my experience in working uh, as a director of Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, as vice president of the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, working uh, closely with the director of California, uh, Oregon, other states. Uh, I look forward to continuing to build those partnerships. And I think the tribes are also very important on, in the water issue, as are irrigators, um, as are many. So um, I, I agree, building those relationships are important. and I very much appreciate the question yesterday, and I think the challenge before all of us is, how do we build credibility for government, um, and specifically for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? And I think I th it's such a good question, and I think the world is changing quickly, that our traditional ways of reaching out aren't always enough. And I think that goes to a question of, of Senator Capito's as well, that at the Fish and Wildlife Service, if, if I'm confirmed, we will continue to be creative in how we reach out to people and how we um, stay engaged. So thank you. thank you. Not an additional question, just a closing comment. Uh, also look forward to working with you on um, access to yeah. nature uh, and wildlife, particularly for some of the more densely populated communities in uh, California, particularly Southern California, we know that national wildlife refuges uh, offer tremendous opportunities. There's some existing uh, that uh, uh, could use a little bit more support uh, and enhancement. So I look forward to working with you on a number of fronts. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Madam Senator. Chair. Thank you. Senator Kramer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Ms. Williams, for being here. Thank you for our conversation yesterday. Um, I apologize to Senator Lummis for holding you up and uh, getting to her meeting late, but she was fine with it. <laughs> But, uh, as far as I know. Anyway, but, uh, but, th but thank you for that. I, I found it um, instructive. Um, 
and of course, we spent a lot of time talking about what we're going to talk about now, and that's waterfall production area easements, um, particularly pre-1976 easements that were uh, signed by grandfather, great-grandfather of, of lots of landowners throughout North Dakota uh, with uh, you know, goodwill and good intention, but they've been very frustrated, as you know, and <clears throat> I won't plow all that ground again. You and I have been through it, um, but... I, I told you I'd probably show you a picture, and, and I brought it with me. You may have seen this picture before. This is a plot of land that has a, has a WPA easement on it. It is a plot of land that I visited with your predecessor, Ms. Skipwith, uh, uh, last year. It is the same photo that I showed uh, Ms. Estenos uh, at her confirmation hearing bef before I voted for her uh, for confirmation as Assistant Secretary, and I show it to you now. And this represents, uh, obviously, a farmer's land with a WPA easement on it. And I asked Ms. Estenos, and I'm going to ask you and maybe anybody else that wants to answer, what do you think is the wetland in this picture? And by the way, you do not have to consult the hydrologist to answer this question, because I'm not one, and I'm pretty, it's pretty obvious to me. Well, Senator Kramer, I, I, I think I could offer a very long answer. Mm -hmm. The importance of the prairie pothole region is, is so critically important to migratory birds, to hunters, and um, ducks uh, throughout the world, really. So I would not offer to answer exactly what a wetland is in that question. In the, this is the reason. Mm -hmm. is that sometimes wetlands are ephemeral. Sometimes wetlands um, appear dry and you don't see the surface water. So what, what I would do is be happy to um, see it on the ground, look at the maps myself, and really uh, learn about the specifics mm -hmm. of this place, Senator Kramer. Would it surprise you that when great-grandfather signed the easement, for this plot of land, and the acres in the easement that were contracted to be wetlands um, in, prior to 1976, that the contract says lakes, ponds, and other types of wetlands. Now, so since you don't know, put that back up real quickly, though. Just for those of you who aren't hydrologists or don't like long answers, <clears throat> this is water. This is water. It's always there. It's, it's what you would call a lake. Or, and this is probably a pond, or maybe they're both ponds or both lakes. There's no question that that's water. Now, show, now bring up the other map. This is the, this is the Fish and Wildlife Service map of the easement, the modern map. Under your direction and your predecessors, they've been modernizing the maps. The original maps were hand-drawn in pencil um, and included lakes. This is the same plot of land. Um, all of this... All of these little 5.45 acres, 4.2, acres, 0.42 acres, 0.88 acres, 0.2 acres. These are all now wetlands in the easement. The lake up in the northeast is no longer a wetland. That's called bait and switch. That is what has, you just made a strong commitment to, to Senator Padilla that you're going to, you, you use the word continue several times, which is concerning to me because I'm not interested in continuing the same old thing. I'm, in a, I'm interested in it doing it right and doing it a new way. And that is recognizing that water is water and dry land is dry land, okay? And, and that the contracts with landowners matter. You also just highlighted the importance of the prairie pothole region to ducks and migratory birds and all this. But you know who it's really, really important to? The farmer that owns it. The farmer that has been making a living on it. The farmer that's been growing food for a hungry world population, largely of other people largely of other people. And that, the farmers on land like this have been so abused by the federal government that they no longer want to enter into the, these easements. They no longer want to voluntarily conserve. In fact, in my state of North Dakota, many farmers are being punished because they did this before, before the Fish and Wildlife Service came along. I just want to ask one simple question before it's over. Now, I've been through this with a secretary, an assistant secretary, two assistant secretaries now, a Fish and Wildlife Service um, director, administrator, and nothing's changed. Republicans, Democrats, moderates, conservatives, I don't know, maybe some liberals, I don't know, it doesn't matter to me. Nobody's done anything about this. 
You've been the acting director for some time. I want to know why I should support you, because I supported all the, your predecessors. Now I want to know why I can count on you to do something different for the landowners as well as the critters that rely on good conservation practices. Senator Kramer, thank you for the question, and I appreciated visiting with you on this issue. I um, understand, I completely understand that it's very important to you, it's very important to your constituents. And I also recognize it's very important for people to know that they're being dealt with unfairly and matters like this. So when you started um, the question and when you were speaking, you um, talked about wanting to get this right. And I, what I can commit is I too want to get this right. And um, I think that you have given me a challenge that I am really looking forward to diving into and um, finding a more positive way forward. So I would like to, to commit to you to do that. Um, yeah, I, I just recognize that this is very important for you in your state. And um, it's important for, as we talk about, it's important for the credibility of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And it's important for my relationship with you as well. Yes. All of those things are true. And I, I'm looking forward to that. I'm hopeful for it. Um, I'm less optimistic each time this promise is made and each time somebody comes and visits and each time um, nothing changes. It, I mean, I know you received a letter from a whole bunch of my landowners and, and ag groups um, earlier this year, uh, much earlier this year in your acting capacity. I, I don't know if you've read the letter or responded to it, but there hasn't been a change yet in, in a single appeal, including appeals that have gone all the way to the director. Um, now, the one thing that I will say for this, and I will wrap up, is the new mapping and all of these failed attempts to, to, to do the right thing, in my view, um, have led to a really good record, a really good record for the landowner and for the state. And, uh, and I, I'm not a big fan of litigation, but we're getting really close to that being the only solution here. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get it fixed before that. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Whitehouse. Thanks, Chairman. Welcome, Ms. Williams. Glad to have you here. Um, just two topics with you. One is um, whenever we have people here from the department, I want to make sure that I raise the issue of oceans and coasts. I know very well that it's called the Department of the Interior, and too often that seems to be also its focus. Um, We've spent years dealing with the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which I think is probably better described as the Upland and Freshwater Conservation Fund because so much of the uh, effort there goes to upland and freshwater projects and not even to coastal states so much, but even in coastal states to upland and freshwater projects in those coastal states. So I'm just going to um, take this opportunity to remind you that America's a coastal nation, and we have a lot of coastal states, and um, they are at unprecedented risk as a result of fisheries moving about because the oceans are warming, uh, acidification doing damage to um, everything from coral reefs to the little critters like pteropods that make up the base of the oceanic food chain. Um, and of course, the ocean is more and more coming ashore in our states as a result of sea level rise and worsening storms. These are all the various prices of fossil fuel emissions and the resulting changes in our climate and oceans that those emissions have provoked. So I'd love to hear you. Um, I know you come from a square state and the secretary also comes from an inland square state and we wanna make sure that um, coastal America is not overlooked at the Department of Interior. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. And I want to start off with, I understand the importance of this issue and that oceans and coasts do face unprecedented challenges. Uh, I, while I have called a square state, a rectangle state, my home for a long time, I did grow up in Maryland and- uh, that's very, coastal. We'll give you. We'll grant you that. I On very of much. Harden, uh, we'll accept. Uh, it. Very much appreciate the the national treasure of the Chesapeake Bay, and um, which is and, almost as nice as Narragansett Bay. Yes, 
and, and I understand you come from the ocean state, and, and it's very important, and it is to me, too. Um, it's also uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service. If I'm confirmed as director, I will absolutely support those uh, programs that are deeply engaged in coastal issues and oceans. I recognize the challenge with climate change, um, the need for coastal resiliency, the importance to communities. And, and I think of the example, uh, Senator Whitehouse of going to Prime Hook Wildlife Refuge with Chairman Carper and seeing what can be done in a coastal restoration project and the many benefits that can provide. Well, as you know, in Rhode Island, all of our wildlife refuges are coastal. Um, and in addition to those issues, there's one I'd like to specifically direct your attention to, and that is that in the previous administration, it seems that an edict came down from on high that um, was not very um, nuanced, let's say, about locations. And that was there will be increased hunting in the refuges. Well, our refuges aren't all that big. Some of them are, you know, a little bit over a mile in area maybe. Um, and they have a lot of use and they have nearby neighbors. So hunting in a small area with a lot of neighbors and a lot of use is a very different problem than it is in vast areas of wildlife refuge where people can go in for literally days uh, on a hunting trip. And it's created a lot of unhappiness with neighbors, hikers, walkers. Um, and it did not seem that in the previous administration it was very easy to get anybody's attention to this, that it was just there shall be hunting and we're not really interested in what the local conditions are. So I would urge your attention to continuing to work with us to find favorable local resolutions for these small and heavily used um, wildlife refuges in my state. So if you'll help me with that, yeah, Senator, that's what I want to hear. I look forward to working with you on that and I realize that, that place matters and that we will always work with local communities and tailor um, our regulations to the locality. At the same time, um, hunting and fishing is very important in many areas as well and um, is part of providing access uh, to nature for, for many Americans. But I look forward to paying attention, Senator Whitehouse, and working with you on this. You're more likely to see a stroller than yep. game in our wildlife refuges. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lummis. <laughs> Very different. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ch uh, Madam Chairman. And uh, thank you for your time yesterday, Ms. Williams. Uh, it was nice to see you yesterday, and congratulations on your nomination. Uh, I'm always happy to see someone who served in state government here in Washington because um, I am of the opinion that the states are the great incubators of innovation and the best ideas tend to percolate up from the states. So my first question is about federalism. Do you support the states having the lead role in managing wildlife within their respective state borders? Senator Lomas, and again, yeah, I appreciated getting to visit with you yesterday and uh, always like talking to someone who uh, comes at issues from the same place. Um, coming from the West. So as the previous director of Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and um, working from a state perspective, yes, I think that um, states play a critical role. And as I said in my opening statement, wildlife conservation is a shared responsibility. And um, this American model of ours, it's part of making sure we understand the different roles we play. The Fish and Wildlife Service um, steps in when 
species are in the emergency room and are listed as threatened or endangered. But the primary management of species that are not listed as threatened or endangered or not migratory birds or not covered by federal law in another way um, remain with the states because states um, are on location, they understand the place, they understand the context, and have so you So you context. would agree that states play the lead role unless the ESA kicks in? Uh, or the Migratory Bird Act? Uh, Senator Lummis, I would, I would say that states play a lead role, but I, I would be careful to parse out the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the Lacey Act, Okay, if, if those federal laws don't apply. Yes, the states Then the states play, play the lead role. Okay, thank yes. you. Now, uh, in Wyoming, as you know, we talked about yesterday our concern about grizzlies. They're way over objective. Do you support delisting the greater Yellowstone ecosystem population of the grizzly bear? Senator Lamas, I appreciated I'm visiting with you on grizzly bears, and I support... Uh, recovery, the long-term recovery of grizzly bears, and very much appreciate the efforts and the leadership that um, Wyoming, for example, has put into that. Okay, so long-term recovery. Well, it's been a long-term recovery, and they are recovered. Every single objective criteria has been met, and then when the bar's been raised before, that objective has been met, and it's been raised again, and that objective has been met. So do you intend to demand additional requirements or raising the bar again in future delisting? Senator Lummis, if confirmed, I will make sure the Fish and Wildlife Service adheres to the law, the Endangered Species Act, and the underlying science. So. Does the recent petition filed by an environmental group challenging gray wolf delisting have any bearing on grizzly bear delisting in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? Uh, Senator Lummis, um, and I realize I, it, thinking about the grizzly bear answer, what I didn't provide is the context of having chaired the interagency grizzly bear committee and um, having worked with the governor of Montana to put together a grizzly bear advisory council. So I you know, am steeped in um, predator uh, conservation and understand the challenges um, of recovery and management of those species. So I think that there are some uh, similarities for wolves and grizzly bears because of the, their predators but otherwise, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service, if confirmed as director, the Fish and Wildlife Service will certainly look at the science specific to the species. Well, but I think what I'm hearing you say is that you're not willing. You're not willing. Senator, I'm not willing. To consider delisting the grizzly bear in the greater Yellowstone area. Senator Lummis, I apologize if I said that I'm not willing to consider delisting of the greater Yellowstone population. I, would I Do you believe all the science has been met? Do you know that all the science has been met? Uh, Senator Lummis, as you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service put out a species status assessment on this very question. And while population numbers are robust in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. There are also elements um, when listing and delisting species, there are five criteria that the Fish and Wildlife Service must meet. The species status assessment noted, as has a court has noted, that there are still um, elements that we need to work through. As I have talked to the director, as you know, Director Nesvik in Wyoming and Montana and Idaho on meeting those, the criteria of adequate regulatory mechanisms on recalibration and on genetic connectivity. That's what the court has repeatedly required. And none of and those criteria. 
I'm, you're about a minute and a half over. So I am. Just, so I'm, I apologize. Uh, we'll Mr. recognize Chair. you again. We'll Thank you. You again. Thank I promise. You. Okay. Uh, Senator Kelly, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Ms. Williams, thank you for joining today and for your willingness uh, to serve. Um, I really appreciate that, and uh, many Arizonans do as well. Uh, I want to begin by asking you about an ongoing challenge that communities throughout Arizona are facing from salt cedars. Salt cedars are an invasive plant species that de deplete scarce water. Um, and they increase the risk of flooding and wildfires. Uh, about six months or so ago, I uh, took a helicopter tour of the West Valley, west of Phoenix, where the Salt River meets the Gila River, and the scale and the scope of the problem is uh, it's rather disturbing. I mean, it's, it is uh, it's pretty, pretty enormous. Um, slowing the spread of salt cedars is a priority for Rio Reimagined, uh, which is made up of local governments, business groups, and nonprofits. And while our local coalition has taken important steps to combat the spread of salt cedars, federal support can help accelerate these efforts. So, Ms. Williams, what role do you believe that the Fish and Wildlife Service has in helping localities combat the spread of invasive plant species? And what resources does Fish and Wildlife provide to localities to make the sort of investments to combat these uh, invasive species? Senator Kelly, um, thank you for that question, um, specifically because invasive species cost the U.S. economy um, $120 billion per year. So I hear it's, a very, it's a very important to you and to your state, and it is across the nation as well. Uh, the Department of the Interior addresses invasive species collectively, and the Fish and Wildlife Service plays an important role in the Department of the Interior effort to combat invasive species. And I, to explain or to indicate how much I understand this is a critical issue to address, when I was the director of Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, we uh, had invasive aquatic species, mussels, move into Montana and we stood up a very, with the help of many partners, and the legislature stood up a program to um, prevent the spread of the invasive species and to mitigate any impacts. And, and we're able to hold the line for mussels not to cross the continental divide into the only drainage, the Columbia River um, system that did not have aquatic uh, mussels. So I just want to, I say that as an example to illustrate how I recognize this is a very important issue. And the Fish and Wildlife Service will work always um, with partners and in localities on salt cedar, especially. Um, we just play a very critical role. The way that we deliver um, invasive species uh, prevention within the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so as, as a part of the Department of the Interior's efforts, it's um, cross-programmatic. And, you know, obviously in all of the regions. So, so we come at it from a collective effort within the service with many programs, whether it's fisheries and aquatic services, whether it's through law enforcement, um, which both played a very important role in combating the moss balls and stopping those nuding. So um, this is something that's important and we will always commit to um, helping combat invasive species, especially in your state with salt cedar. Hey, this one's very critical for us because the amount of water that these salt cedars consume and when you consider that we're in a 20 year drought with Lake Powell and Lake Mead at historic low levels, um, the, this is one of the areas that we need to uh, address. We need to be able to conserve um, every drop of water. And so I uh, look forward to working with you and your office to come up with a con 
comprehensive plan on how we're going to deal with this invasive species. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kelly. I look forward to working with you on this. Perfect timing. Alaska is reported for duty. Thank you. You're recognized. Mr. Senator Chairman, Sullivan. Captain. Colonel. Uh, good to see you. Um, Ms. Williams, thank you for the meeting yesterday. I appreciate it. I appreciate the time and uh, the topics we discussed. I want to start with an issue that you and I kind of talked about, but I want to make it a little bit more public here. So the Biden administration keeps talking about racial equity, environmental equity. I'm all for that, but how do you define that? Because it's confusing to some of us as it relates to the environment. How do you, how do you define that? Senator Sullivan, um, and I too appreciated the, uh, your time yesterday and getting to visit on issues about your special and unique state, um, the great state of Alaska. So if I understand your question, um, I think of serving all Alaskans. But I'm, I'm talking about that they do a lot on racial equity, environmental equity, nobody it's very, these are new terms. I didn't know what they meant until the Biden administration came. I still don't know what they mean, but what, what do you think they mean in the environmental area? Senator Sullivan, so this is one of the four priorities this administration set out, and the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, under my direction so far, and if confirmed, uh, we will continue to have a robust uh, implementation of racial, social justice, racial equity. Let me, racial let me, equity means to me, Senator, yeah. is treating everyone fairly yeah. and being inclusive in how we work Good. with everyone and making all feel that they belong and are part of the outdoor experience. Let me, uh, let me give you my definition as far as I've seen it. I think there's been 19 executive orders or executive actions from this administration that are focused on Alaska, mostly shutting down Alaska, harming Alaskans. They don't ask, they just do it. I think the Biden administration's environmental justice agenda is trying to help minority populations unless they're indigenous people in Alaska. That's what I think. Because every action, so many of the actions that this administration takes harms Alaska native people. I mean, they almost go out of their way. Anwar, King Cove, the Alaska Native Vietnam Veteran Allotment Act, which the secretary committed to me that she would expedite. She's put a delay on that. Vietnam veterans, Mr. Chairman, who are native, who got screwed by their country, are now going to die before this bill is, is implemented. The sea otter management. I mean, the list is so long. And it, oh, by the way, the $2 trillion relief bill that had a provision saying tens of thousands of Alaska natives don't get relief. Could you imagine any other group in America where the Congress and the president, the Democrats and the Congress say all these minorities get relief for COVID, but one group in one state, they don't get any relief. It's called discrimination. Last time I looked. So I want you to, and let me give you one other one. This one you and I talked about. This is why I get so riled up about these issues. This is a study by the American Medical Association. It shows where people in America, their life expectancy increased from 1980 to 2014 or decreased. Unfortunately, in a few places in our country, it decreased, mostly because of the opioid epidemic. The, cut, the part of America that increased the most life expectancy was Alaska, particularly the native communities. And here's a reason why, resource development, responsible resource development. So when this administration targets my state to shut down these opportunities, it is literally a matter of life and death. And when US senators like Senator Heindrich of New Mexico constantly send letters to the administration saying, hey, shut down this Alaska project, that Alaska project, it really, really, riles me up. So here's my question for you. I don't want my constituents' life expectancy to go negative in the wrong direction. It's going the right direction now. North Slope, 
Northwest Arctic Borough, Aleutian Island change. That's all because they had responsible resource development opportunities. This administration is trying to crush those. And literally, for my constituents, a matter of life and death. And for the Native people, again, Biden administration, environmental equity seems to exclude a certain indigenous population in America, my constituents. You and I had a long talk about this yesterday. I would like to get your commitment on every one of these attempts to lock up my state that you look at hurting, is it going to hurt Alaskans, working families? Is it going to hurt Native people? Because usually it is, and nobody's asking us. And your agency is a huge offender. You care to comment on this? You can tell it makes me a little bit upset. And... <laughs> I, I just want to know. The discrimination against indigenous people in my state needs to stop. The war on working families against people in my state needs to stop. And your agencies is going to be a big part of it. So what's your thinking on this? And you can be as long or short as you want. Senator Sullivan, thank you for that question. And again, I appreciated visiting you, with you on this issue yesterday. And um, Racial equity, Alaska Natives are very important, I know. To they don't seem important to this, this administration. Admi they seem targeted, to be honest. And the, if I am confirmed, the Fish and Wildlife Service will uh, work very closely with Alaska Natives. I care very much how we deliver our conservation mission in Alaska as an example, and I know that um, we, we talk about Alaska Natives and Alaska Native corporations differently than we do tribes in the lower 48, but I do have experience and working closely with tribes on a number of issues. And um, so I look forward to absolutely being in contact with you, Senator Sullivan, working closely with you and making sure, if confirmed, the Fish and Wildlife Service delivers fairly transparently with Alaska Natives uh, corporations, but all Alaskans. Yeah, all Alaskans. Because all Alaskans. this really, it's easy for my colleagues in the administration to kind of, hey, let's shut down Alaska, right? It's a Republican state. There's only 730,000 people there. The radical environmental groups are always asking us to shut it down. Let's do it. This administration is doing it even more than the Obama administration, which is kind of remarkable. Um, and, and it's hurting people. Senator's time has more than Mr. Expired. Chairman, it's a really important issue. Uh, but I would invite. I, I hope we can have a hearing in this committee. My state's being targeted. Targeted. They're not targeting Delaware. That's for damn sure. And it's really hard on the people I represent. And uh, I'm getting more and more mad about it. And I, and I think you can understand. Sure. The, uh, I would invite the senator to stay. I'm going to ask some questions. You're welcome to ask. If no one else shows up, you're welcome to continue this conversation. Thank you for, for joining us today. And for your uh, for your passion, um, I want to uh, return to something we were talking about earlier today. Uh, Senator Capito and I both mentioned the uh, the Infrastructure uh, Investment and Jobs Act, which has been signed into law with great uh, bipartisan support. We're grateful for everybody on our staff on our staffs on this committee, both sides of the aisle, who worked so hard to uh, to provide the foundation on which that bill was uh, was built. But um, the uh, the landmark uh, that landmark legislation includes, I think, about three hundred fifty million dollars for a wildlife crossing pilot program. That's the result of years of bipartisan work by this committee, and uh, this program will address, as you may know, safety issues presented by wildlife vehicle collisions, and also help conserve uh, wildlife by improving habitat connectivity across the country. And that's another win-win. Fish and Wildlife Service will need to work closely with the Department of Transportation to successfully implement this program. And here's my question. How do you think your experience with wildlife vehicle collision and wildlife crossings in Montana has prepared you to lead, help lead the implementation of this new pilot program for the Fish and Wildlife Service, please? First off, uh, Chairman Carper, I want to thank you for your leadership and for all of the members of, their, of this committee 
for your many years of work on this issue and um, really a momentous occasion of getting the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act signed into law. It, it's a big moment and a moment that has been a long time coming. So I thank you for your leadership on that. Uh, another piece of this uh, momentous act passing of this momentous uh, act passing is that it's this, this uncommon or important intersection of transportation and infrastructure in this committee and also natural resources and wildlife conservation. So I appreciate um, that intersection and I think uh, moving forward, we are all working very hard to not be stovepiping these issues, but to be working with them together. So specifically to wildlife crossings and Montana, I have seen firsthand, um, as I think many of us have seen videos of the wildlife that use these crossings, and it is, it's, it's quite extraordinary. You probably don't even realize they're all there until you see the videos. And I think of one video of a crossing, um, a number of, of important crossings on the Flathead Reservation, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. There was a video of somebody sleeping in one of the under um, passes and a uh, grizzly bear, mountain lion, elk, lynx, all these species walking right by this person wrapped up in a blanket under the culvert. But I, th I think- hey, Was the person asleep or petrified? <laughs> I can't answer that. Uh, Senator Carper, I think I might have been petrified had I been that person, yeah. but the, I, I can't under, we can't underestimate the importance of these crossings for safety and for wildlife and Experience shows that species use them and they do help with safety. All right, thank you for that. These, these animals are pretty smart, you know, pretty smart. I'm going to uh, halt my uh, questioning and we've been joined by Senator Cardin and uh, I recognize him for any questions you might have at this time. Senator Cardin, thanks for coming. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and to, to Martha Williams, first of all, thank you for your public service and thank you for your willingness to serve in this critically important position. My understanding is that you have roots in my state of Maryland in Baltimore County on a farm. So uh, that seems to me uh, good sense. But why did you ever move out of Maryland? <laughs> Senator, I can say that I've, I've moved back to D.C. and spend my weekends in Maryland. Is that a good enough answer? That's a good that's, You're getting there. So where was the farm located in Baltimore uh, County? Uh, near Hampstead. Yeah. Upper Co. Yeah, beautiful area. Yes. Of course, that area right now is starting to get developed, so the land is going to be worth a lot more money than it was for farming, I'm afraid. It's, it's getting that way. There are a lot of, um, Senator Cardin, our farm was the first farm in Maryland to go in an agricultural yeah. preservation easement. And so there are many farms actually in the neighborhood, um, in, in the watersheds that are conserved to continue as working farms. And it's something our family has been deeply engaged in for many years. When, when I was Speaker of the, of the House in the state legislature, Jim Clark was president of the Senate. We developed and strengthened the ag uh, easement program for just that reason. Uh, Senator Clark had a farm in right next to Columbia, Maryland, and that's preserved in the easement. So thank you for taking advantage of that program. So, you know, uh, I heard you mentioned already the Chesapeake Bay, uh, but you responded to Senator Whitehouse like there are other bodies of water that are more important than Chesapeake Bay. So I just want to <laughs> have you concentrate a little bit on our importance of your work, fish and wildlife on the bay. We, we are desperately in need of wetlands restoration. We, we're using beneficial use of dredge material to restore wetlands and blackwater uh, a wildlife refuge. We are looking at how we can um, restore islands uh, for wildlife. Uh, we had Poplar Island, which has uh, been restored as a result of use of dredge material. We're now going to Mid Bay. Um, 
we have, uh, I, I know that you, I think you did respond to Senator Whitehouse, who, by the way, is a dear friend of mine, and uh, I strongly support his efforts in regards to the coastal issues, but in regards to the, the coastal programs themselves and protecting our coastlines in regards to uh, fish and wildlife. All these are extremely high priorities. We've had bipartisan support in this committee to do, uh, deal with those programs. My just uh, not request is that we have a very open uh, relationship as it relates to strategies to advance these issues. We're not always in total agreement because so many agencies are involved in fish and wildlife is, is one of those agencies. But we just like to have an open opportunity to make sure that we use every opportunity we can to, to advance these priorities. Thank you, Senator Cardin, and I couldn't agree more um, and realize, we, well, Chesapeake Bay is a national treasure. I hope that um, answers that question. I've been, uh, I, I want to be very polite and serious. At the same time, I do want you to know that uh, I carry my Maryland roots with me and have uh, Old Bay seasoning with me <laughs> at all times, as do my children and much to the chagrin of those around us who don't quite understand our affinity for the spice. But um, in all seriousness, the Chesapeake Bay is so important. Our coastal programs are so important. It's going to be critical for climate change, for climate resilience, and... Um, I had the opportunity to mis visit Masonville Cove. I have a promise to have a friend take me out to Poplar Island, I'm, and I've talked to our wildlife refuge staff. I'm looking forward to going there. And um, so I'm a, a huge supporter of these programs and absolutely look forward to working closely with you, Senator Cardin, and, um, and being in close contact and understanding your concerns and these issues as they evolve. I, I think that we've made great strides, um, but we have a lot of work to do and very much appreciate your and this committee's commitment to these issues. Well, um, thank you for that. Uh, I've been to Poplar Island many times. It's much nicer in warmer weather than colder weather. Just warning you that it, Cold uh, I'd love right. to join you and I'll, I'll be pleased to join you, but I'm not sure uh, having been on the White House lawn with Senator Carper for the bill signing of the infrastructure bill and wondering whether I would be able to move my body again. It was so cold. Uh, it, let's look for warmer weather when we go out and visit these, these just incredible uh, restoration areas that we've been able to create. You'll see incredible wildlife there that we uh, that have returned. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, and uh, the, what we're doing at Blackwater with the restoration of wetlands is, is again, the, the wildlife there is absolutely spectacular. So, and as you know, in Maryland, we have a lot of, uh, of, of preserves that are conducive to wildlife, but we need to make, pay attention to restore these areas. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Senator Cardin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator, Senator Cardin. And that was a chilly day on Monday, wasn't it? <laughs> chilly day. I was pretty amazed at the Speaker of the House and also one of our colleagues, uh, Senator Cinema, to be able to stand out there in that kind of weather and uh, to stand and deliver, and despite the very cold, breezy, breezy, very cold, windy conditions. Very cool. All right, got two, uh, two more questions, and I don't know if we'll be joined by some other colleagues, either uh, virtually or in person, but I have a couple of questions. One of them deals with state uh, experience. Senator Cardin has served many uh, years uh, as a state legislator, Speaker of the House in Maryland, as you may know. And I had the privilege of serving as treasurer and governor of, uh, of my state. So I have uh, fond memories of, of those, those days. Um, I really, uh, in those days, I still do, but really enjoyed in those days rolling up uh, my sleeves and, and just trying to get things done, working across the aisle with uh, other officials uh, in the first state, with the environmental community, with the business community on matters of both regional and national importance. Uh, from our conversations, I know you share a passion uh, for that experience through your time leading the Montana Department of Fish and Wildlife and, and Parks. What are, uh, when you look back, when you reflect back, what are, are you most proud of from your time uh, leading that department and how did that role in particular shape you as a leader in wildlife conservation? 
Thank you for that question, Senator Carper. Uh, you know, my children always would ask me, what do you actually do, Mom? And um, what, do you, what do you get done? <laughs> and I would answer uh, sometimes um, a bit too broadly. What am I most proud of? I'm most proud of, frankly, uh, leading and overseeing uh, an agency of career public servants uh, to best achieve the mission of conservation and to empower them um, within clear guidelines to do the best work that they could do. So I'm most proud of my leadership of overseeing and leading an agency, a conservation agency. I am proud of the uh, habitats that we conserved and restored in my tenure. I am proud of the relationships we built of the Montana way of doing business where um, we worked with everyone. It's not uh, crossing the aisles or politics. Um, it's you, you work with every background and um, in a way where you learn how to deliver, where you, I am proud of the way in which I worked um, and listened to people, sometimes frustratingly so, uh, learned every day, all day, every day on the job. Um, I think I learned especially just uh, how much I still have to learn and that uh, what did I learn most especially? That these issues are hard but we are lucky that people care about them and so that we have engagement and um, can, even if it seems tense at first, I learned how key it is to just loosen that knot and to get it started, to get conversations started and to get the work moving in the right direction. So I, I, I'm always learning that, but that's something that became so apparent to me that Sometimes the key step is to just start to loosen that uh, knot. And uh, so I'm proud of our people. I'm proud of the resources. Um, I'm proud of the people who lived in our state. And so I hope to apply that, those lessons, um, if confirmed as director and realize that uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service oversees the resources in all of this great nation and international uh, wildlife as well. And so to always pay attention to the context of a place and the people there and realize the issues will um, need to be to some degree specific to the place and the people in that locality. Thank you. Thank you for that very thoughtful response. Senator Cardin and I get uh, asked uh, questions by the press, all kinds of different questions. and. I was asked by, I think it was the Washington Post a month or two ago, um, some questions, a little different uh, sorts of questions. One of them was, what do you do? And, uh, and I responded, I, I provide the, the answer that I provide to uh, students uh, when I go to like elementary schools, maybe middle schools or high schools. And I, I said, um, I, I work with people like Senator Cardin and 98 other senators. We help make the rules for the country. And I said to the students, do you have, uh, uh, rules in your school, yes. Do you have rules on your school bus, yes. Do you have rules at home, yes. We have rules for a country. And along with 99 other senators and 435 House members, the president, vice president, I get to help make the rules for the country. And one one kid once answered, asked me at a school assembly, said, well, what else do you do? And uh, and I said, uh, uh, I help people. My staff and I, we help people. My colleagues and I, we try to help people. And uh, that's uh, a great source of, of joy for for, uh, for, for, for us. Um, I uh, will have one, um, one more, uh, yeah, you know, the other question, one of the other questions Ben they asked us was, what are you proudest of that you've done in your life? And I said, helping to raise three boys, and uh, which is a source of great joy, still is. And they're boys to men, but still a source of great joy. All right, um, on to, uh, I think for me the last question would be, you know, this just deals with the Delaware River uh, Basin Conservation Act, we both care about the Chesapeake Bay, we also care about the Delaware Bay and the Delaware River, but along with a, a number of other states. But uh, in uh, 2016, 
Uh, I worked with uh, a number of our colleagues to secure passage of the Delaware River, River Basin Conservation Act, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation have done, I think, an exceptional job in standing up the Delaware Watershed Conservation Fund, which is directed by that piece of legislation. Uh, the program leverages private dollars to restore polluted waters, uh, to enhance fish and wildlife habitat, and to increase access to nature. The Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act included uh, $28 million to expand on these important efforts. And I would just ask, are, are you familiar with this? The Del River Basin Conservation Act something that you're familiar with. And if so, would you elaborate on the importance of the regional, this regional conservation program and, and other programs like it? Thank you, Chairman Carper. Um, I think that I uh, appreciate the leadership for the act. It's uh, an example, one of many, but a very important example of the power of what I hope a, a theme I have conveyed, the power of these uh, collaborative, coordinated, um, deliberate efforts that brings, first of all, leverages money um, and leverages expertise so that the delivery of conservation is um, that much more, exponentially more than one entity could do on their own. So the Fish and Wildlife Service um, could never deliver this type of conservation on its own. It is the collective effort and the leverage of the um, funding that make it so effective. And I just like, uh, in a way, Prime Hook National Wildlife Refuge and the project that we viewed there. Um, this too is an example that I think could be replicated elsewhere. And, and I would answer that we are all, I think in, in this profession, look for examples where we can um, take the pieces of them and replicate them, what works, and adapt um, what needs to be adapted for a specific location and place. But the Delaware um, River Basin is as very important. Um, and so I just really commend these efforts. And I know that our um, regional office and leadership has been key in building the relationships to make this so effective. And so if I'm confirmed as director, I would make sure that um, leadership direction um, in this instance, I would call her out, Wendy Weber have been extraordinary and I will support other efforts like that of other regional directors uh, to make such a difference. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks. Is Senator Cardin, any more questions? No, just again to, to thank you for your service and uh, look forward to working with you. Thank you, Senator. I have a, just a real short statement, closing statement. Thanks, uh, I want to thank Senator Cardin and others, are certainly a ranking member and other members of the committee who joined us in person and virtually. Um, and uh, we want to thank you, uh, Ms. Williams, for not just for being here, but we're grateful for your willingness to serve in, in this capacity. And I, I would just say to your, uh, your children who are here as well, um, I'm grateful to them for their willingness to serve you, uh, share you, to share you with our, our country. But um, it's a time when we face both uh, great conservation uh, challenges, but great opportunities as well. And uh, your conduct uh, today, I think, has helped demonstrate why our president made such an excellent choice for this critical leadership role at the Fish and Wildlife Service. And we are looking forward to seeing you confirm without delay so that you can get to work on behalf of the, uh, the American people. Uh, before we adjourn, a little bit of housekeeping. And uh, I want to ask uh, unanimous consent, if I can convince Senator uh, Cardin not to object. Uh, I'm going to ask for unanimous consent to uh, submit for the record a variety of materials that include letters from stakeholders and other materials that relate to today's nomination hearing. Uh, is there objection? Hearing none. Senators will be allowed to submit questions for the record through the close of business on Wednesday, November 24th. And we will compile those questions and send them to our witness and, and ask you to reply by Wednesday, December 1st. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. My thanks to all of you.